Jetson Pache, who is a class of 84 graduate of Boston College and a screenwriter uh, in Los Angeles, and also David James Elliott, who is uh, the star of the television show Jet. Uh, before we get started, we're going to just show you a brief little clip, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll go from there. We'll introduce our guests, and, and uh, we'll, I'll have a little uh, question and answer with them myself, and then we'll open it up to the floor, and uh, hopefully, since I, I get a sense there's a mix here of um, film students, communication students, and JAG fans, I'm going to try to do my best to um, <laughs> mix and match the questions uh, so everyone will get a little something out of my questions, but then, as I said, at the end of the show, you'll be able to uh, ask, uh, ask away, okay? So let's uh, start with the clip. change my mind, man. The moment I don't think you can overcome your doubts, I'll suggest you hand in those oath leaves. Commander, are you aware that your substitute counsel is unwilling to deal? Yes, Colonel. He talked me into it. You're not going to hold this against me? Yes. Well, what are you going to do, not talk to me? No, I'm going to beat you in the race tomorrow. <laughs> Mac. You don't think I can? Not without a shortcut. Mm. Look, I want you to do well, but reach for something attainable. This is attainable. I have three minutes on you. You could have six minutes on me and you wouldn't beat me. Fine. I'll take it. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, please welcome John Jetson Pache and uh, David James Elliott. Basically, uh, I think I'd like to just start off with uh, asking you guys, how, you know, how did you get to Jack? How did you get, as an actor there and also as a writer, uh, to have a uh, produced uh, script that uh, made it to television? Uh, uh, Script-wise, I went to town with a couple hundred bucks in my pocket, and I thought that the way to sell the script was to get an agent, go through the proper channels, but once you hit town, there's a whole bunch of different rules that apply. And um, basically, I, I started writing in 1986, and I got to town with the script in 1993. And uh, I, I guess, to put it in short, the best way to sell a script, or the best way to get noticed is, in the Hollywood, the secret is, it's not, uh, you could be William Shakespeare, you could be uh, uh, Robert Ludlum, but it's who you know and when you know them. Unfortunately for me, I have a twin brother who went to school here with me also in 1983, and we formed a business which, which got us onto the sets and got us through a lot of back doors. And fortunately for me, my twin brother and I met David early on, and uh, Joe uh, talked to David, and David really loved running. So one of the first things I was able to write for TV was this Jackathon, Jackathon story, and from there we kind of hit it off, and uh, that's how I got started. In this what was the business that got you onto film sets? Entertainment marketing. It's called product placement, and now it's called brand integration, but through, it was, the great thing about it was that all the scripts from the studios came through the door of, of our business mm -hmm. for the product. So I got to read what Rob, Rip, Robert Town was writing. I got to read what uh, the next um, uh, Sidney Sheldon script was. So I was, I was always privy to the scripts that were coming in, and uh, then, then the back door. I went to college, like like the other, studied acting uh, for four years, and then I uh, studied in theater in, in, uh, in Canada. And, uh, Are you from there? Yeah, I'm a Canadian. I didn't mean to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I'm from. And, uh, and uh, you know, I studied in the business that way. I got an agent, uh, 
somebody I knew in, uh, I was a member of the staff of the Shakespeare Festival Company for a couple of years, and somebody there must have known me, maybe. And, uh, and then I wound up in Hollywood because there was an ad in the uh, paper. This is how goofy Hollywood is. There was an ad in the paper. They were looking for a Davy Crockett business was to introduce a Davy Crockett movie, which was a backdoor pilot. And uh, he sent a tape down. They sent back some material. We put it on a tape and sent it back down. They said, you know, we'd like to see this guy. So they flew me down, and I screen tested at Disney, and the head of uh, casting there liked my tape, the, liked the screen test, and hooked me up with her agent. I didn't get that job, but Disney gave me a holding deal. They paid me like uh, $20,000 to not work for three months while they wrote a TV show just for me, because they loved me that much. So I went back to Canada with this money, and I kept working there. And then when they'd written the script, they flew me back in. I had to test again. And then they told me that the script that they'd written specifically for me, that I was too young to play the part. And so the, the thing was never made. And How old uh, were you? But I wound up with an agent. Uh, I think it was, I don't know, maybe 28 at the time. Uh, but uh, the agent that she hooked me up with asked if I would consider coming down. And uh, so I took you know, the little money. I was doing a television series at the time in Canada. deal down there. Uh, and then I wound up auditioning for JAG eventually. You know, I did uh, I did a series called The Untouchables, mm -hmm. which was shot in Chicago. That went two years. That, uh, they told me when we uh, auditioned for that, that uh, we were waiting in the room, there was like eight guys that had been narrowed down. So they auditioned everybody, and then they slowly narrowed down. I don't know, are there, are there acting students down here tonight? Do you guys teach acting? Oh, great. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and then they came out at the final meeting, or it was supposed to be the final meeting, wound up not being, but uh, we're in the Paramount in the uh, offices of the big shots, and uh, they came up and said the uh, casting director was one of the great casting directors. Uh, he said, whoever gets this part will be set for life. You'll never have to work again. <laughs> wow. Let's keep the pressure on a little, a little more. So uh, I got the part, and of course, series went less than two years, and I was not set for life, so, uh, <laughs> and that's kind of how it happened. Is, uh, is it true, uh, John, you mentioned um, it's who you know. Um, I've, I've heard someone say uh, it's not who you know, but who knows you. I think it's who you know, and it's when you, and it's basically, it's, it's a timing thing. You have to, it, I went, you, first thing I did when I went to, when I had my script, I went and I made phone calls to agents, literary agents. And I went from William Morris all the way down to, U, uh, to ICM to all the great literary agencies that I thought were good. Every literary agent that I ended up speaking with, they had a full roster of clients, so they had no time for the new kid on the block. So then I started cold calling the studios. I had written a, a spec script uh, that it was, I still think is a very original idea that Hollywood hasn't hit upon yet, and it's still uh, in certain places right now, but I had a really good idea, so I got into a couple of people's offices just kind of acting as my own agent. Can I come in and pitch you? Will you read the script? Please, please, please. Uh, and then I met this guy, and he knew this one's trainer, and then this one over here, and this one's uh, hairstylist. And I went through that route, which you usually do, and uh, came up across a lot of dead ends, but it was, um, it, it, was it, it was very hard at first to just to get noticed, because unlike uh, being an actor, when you're a writer, um, they ha you have to actually get people to read what you've written. And in a town, with an attention span of maybe five seconds, it's very, very hard to get the higher ups to read something from the new kid on the block, especially a 70 or 120 page spec script. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that was my dilemma when I went out there. Yeah, most of, most of the offices have readers, people, assistants who read scripts for the guy. So you, <laughs> so uh, I've known a few people who are readers. They'll go home on a weekend with a stack of you know, 15, 20 scripts and, and try to read through them. Is it true then that the that the reader then gives notes to the executive. Yeah, yeah he'll give a breakdown or he'll go, he'll just, he'll grade the script. So then they this isn't worth reading, this is. So, you know, it's, it's just a tough game. It's a tough game on any level what you do, you know, you, you, especially starting the way John did without any connections and trying to go in that way. And that's a, that's a, a really new mistake. 
understand it's a it's a difficult thing. So when I when when I met John, I I helped him in any way that I could. I, I wasn't a magic pill for him, but you know I got I got him some meetings with some people, and he uh, and maybe you know my influence helped somewhat. But John still had to go in and close a deal, and uh, and he did that, and then he and I started writing together. We've written a, uh, we wrote a couple of Jag scripts. So what is what is the pr for you guys the process of co-writing like? I know I have a lot of uh, screenwriting students or students who are interested in screenwriting. What's the process of um, of co-writing for you? How does that work? Because he, I know he grabbed me and he grabbed me and said we're going to the desert. And I think it was before last summer. And I had a house in Palm Springs. That's right. Yeah. And uh, we went to uh, about twenty different. He David had a very uh, good idea that we we went with the germ of an idea. I said this is it's appealing and I want this is character and then we researched the the genre as it were right and, and then we uh, sat on the couch and we discussed well this plays well this doesn't play and we discussed this and we discussed that and then we agreed upon a, we agreed upon a general direction and we both wrote down our notes and then he rewrites me and I rewrite him and he says that what, what we call it hokey that's hokey Jetson uh, well, I'm going to be this way and, yeah. and then uh, then I'm, it's just it's just basically expanding upon an idea and trying to cut that idea into something See, that it's it's because sometimes we'll sit and write together when we were when we were writing the jag scripts we'd sit in the room and we'd work together and uh, and then other times John will be really passionate about an idea and he'll go off and write his thing and then I'll read it and I'll rewrite it and then we'll get together and he'll you know take the edge off of this or that or argue a point and, and one of the great things about John is you can talk to him about his script without worrying about offending his sensibilities at all. You know, some writers are really prissy about every word remaining there, you know. Yeah. And uh, you know, having started a television series for 10 years and having worked with a lot of different writers, uh, you know, uh, some were uh, easier to work with than others. Especially in television, you know, you really can't be overly sensitive about your material because there's a lot of opinions that need to be weighed. Mm -hmm. It's not like, uh, well, even within film, unless you're an auteur, you know, Even in movies, if uh, film, they'll go, yeah, we like your script, thank you very much, you're going to have him rewrite it. Mm -hmm. And then you've lost it at that point. Then though your name, I think it's the first two writers, uh, I don't know what the exact now rule is, the first two writers get screen credit, but there could be 15 writers on right. the thing. Right. You know, once you hand it over, it's not yours anymore. But you get paid for it. You get paid for it. You know, uh, I, I guess, the point, you know, in the beginning, yes, it's big. You know, in the beginning, I remember coming out of theater school, all these guys who were like, I'm never doing TV or film, man. I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to remain the artist. You know, I'm just doing theater. And you see them now, they're in commercials and, you know, they're doing anything to make ends meet. Yeah. Because it's a, it's a difficult business. It's, uh, well, my first meeting, it was, uh, David, David got me my first meeting and I remember the day to a T. I dressed up, I had my, most people go in, they go in for a pitch meeting, and they go in and they pitch their ideas. And so I actually wrote outlines, five, three or four page outlines. You'd call them compositions in high, in high school, but I wrote five, four page outlines. So when I, I remember standing in front of the hallway with the gentleman I was supposed to have a meeting with, and he was in one of the executive producers of the show. And I'm standing there, I don't even know what he looks like, and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And then I see this older gentleman with a beard walking down the hallway, and before he gets to me, he, he looks... Somebody yelled up from a side office, and he looked in the office, and I heard him. And he said, oh, I got this meeting I got to take. I'll be back in five minutes. So I'm sitting at the door with my six treatments that I've written, and I'm going like, okay, this is, this is this guy's attitude coming in, and I'm going to you know, pitch my six outlines to him, hoping that he'll like one of them after David got me the meeting. So we sat down, and I pulled out my outlines, and uh, he said, oh, you did a lot of work there, huh? And he went, and he said, first thing, if I've written, if we've got a JAG episode that you've uh, written about that we've done before. I'm going to tell you, you know, if we got a JAG episode that we're writing now, I'm going to stop you right there. I'm going to tell you right there, and you know that'll be it. And uh, I said, don't worry, I've done my homework on you. I've seen every JAG episode, and I, mean, I even know the ones you've written, and I even commented on that. So a five-minute meeting turned into like a 45-minute meeting, and they did pick out Jagathlon as the first storyline for me. And uh, it, I mean, it got me started, and it got me on the threshold to where I'm trying to get. Uh, let me ask you this. You mentioned writers on a uh, TV series, and you both have some writing experience. Um, 
it's kind of, uh, you know, people people often equate writers in a feature film, let's say, if it's an envelope or yeah. film, they get less respect or they get their, their ideas are kind of thrown in the back. But whenever I see, uh, let's say, on the Golden Globes or the Emmys or something, uh, an actor win, they always seem to thank the writer first and foremost, or the writer. They always say that without the writing, this wouldn't, and, and it seems as though the writer garners more respect in television. Is that true? Or? I think in the theater, the writer garners more respect. In, in a film, uh, uh, it's a director's meeting of filmmaking, and uh, generally the writer is a pain in the ass. Uh, at a certain point, once they start putting it on the, uh, you know, and, and the writer, I know that uh, I have a friend who works with uh, Robert Redford, who uh, thought that uh, he didn't mind the writer being around for a while, but if he starts having opinions, then, then he's off the set, and he's barred from the set. Uh, in television, writer producers are the kings, you know. But generally, what happens, in my experience, is uh, you get the script in television. You can't, you know, as I said, you really can't be overly sensitive about the material because a lot of opinions will be weighed. That, you know, I would always give notes on the script. Uh, the director would give notes during the uh, eight day prep. I've directed some of the episodes with Jim Jack, Lou, and Mark. And as you prep, you know, you help the. It's always, a, it's, it's more of a work in progress right up to the very end. And they keep, you know, different colored pages come out so that you know where the changes have been made and if you're up to date in the script by mm -hmm. the dated colors on the, on the front. And uh, so it's constantly changing and where, like in the theater, you generally you take a play and, and it's already done and then uh, you come to it. Mm -hmm. Like in movie and, and TV, it generally comes to you, I guess. And one great lesson I've learned from TV is uh, when I first learned to write, somebody taught me how to write said, be creative, don't put any restrictions upon yourself. So I was writing hour-long television shows that were basically features, you know, I'd have helicopters flying and I'd have boats crashing and car chases and by the time the budget of my uh, wannabe TV show was set, it'd probably be like $20 million. So you have to learn to write within a budget also because each show has a different uh, price tag to it as to how well it's going to be produced. And well, that, and be. that, but that's also, you know, when you're like when you're selling a script, if you went to a, a TV, you know, like if you went to pitch uh, a series idea, you, we were, you know, John, you and I were both told when we, when we first pitched uh, this idea, we had the script. We initially came in with those concerns, budgetary concerns. But, you know, Hollywood, like I guess every other business has changed over the years and, and people with that lack imagination but really love to have an opinion are, uh, are in control, kid lawyers, basically, you know. Uh, so you have to write the hell out of the thing and then you trim it down later, you'll adjust it later, but in order to capture their imagination, you've got, you know, car chases and, you know, bombs blowing up downtown New York, you know, and, and you gotta write the hell out of the thing and then you trim it later after you sell the idea, so. It's a process, it's a game, I guess, it's like, and, it's, and it's a business, and, and you really have to approach it like a business. You mentioned um, directing uh, a couple of episodes. Um, as a director of a series that is well known, has its own style, did you feel that restricted your creativity, or actually you were you found you were able to be more creative within that kind of framework? I felt that I wasn't as hampered as a lot of people would have been because I was the star of the show. So I knew that I would I would have leeway and would, you know, allow me to do things that they wouldn't allow other people to do by virtue of my position. And uh, so I, you know, I just went and had fun, you know. The man that I worked for was a bit of a taskmaster and, uh, and, and I guess a, a menacing guy on some level for some people love because it would create a lot of fear uh, in certain directors. And uh, I didn't allow that to hamper my ideas. So. I just went out and played. I did things that I thought would be neat and fun, and in fact, he was fun as well. Too. So it was a show that the only, really, the only criteria that I remember, and it was just a natural thing. He wanted the camera to always be moving. It, you know, in the seventy, you watch the styles change over the years. Seventy TV was very stiff. They didn't move the camera a lot, and as the years have gone on, they brought in uh, steady cam. Initially, that was a, it was like a jewel that you could rent. Very 
he would bring in for specific shots. Now every television show has a steady cam guy. Generally, the VA camera operator uh, is also a steady cam guy, so the, it's always there. It's always available. And, uh, we had uh, the luxury of having at least three cameras available at any point, so you know you make up a lot of time that way. But I guess to answer your question, yes and no. Depends who you are. Talk a little bit about uh, just back on what you were saying. Uh, you, you mentioned it's a lot of it is luck and so on. Um, in terms of persistence, uh, what's the, is there a fine line between persistence and annoyance, and does it matter? Tact. You've got to have tact. I think in anything you do, you got to really be aware that. Uh, and like David said earlier, you can just don't go to town vulnerable. Go to town with a plan. Go to town with a, a bank account. Go to town with a place to stay. And most of all, go to town with a suit of armor on because what one person's opinion of your work will be on one side of town will be totally different on another side of the town. So never ever take anything to heart negative that somebody says about you. If you can learn by it, fine. But if you if you if if you take it to heart, you say I'm no good because this guy doesn't think I'm any good, and you get negative on it, then you'll never ever survive. You know, we, you know, I remember a theater kid who says you can be dissuaded by anyone that you really shouldn't be. And it's something that I tell my children is that, you know, I, I really only ever listen to the positive people. And if anyone ever had anything negative to say to me, I blocked it on my mind. Uh, to, to, as far as tact goes, you certainly need tact. But I, I always believe that if you had talent and if you were in the game, then you had a loss. You know, if you never give up, then you still have a chance. And, uh, you know, I know guys who sit at home and they wait for the phone to ring and they go, well, you know, maybe the agent will call. I would go in day. There's some people you can bother, and then there's other people that you can't bother. So I would bother my agents and get them to bother. It's a it's an odd business because you're you're not selling like John's out selling a product uh, in his other business or pushing this or that. It's easier for him to stand there and say this vacuum cleaner is, is awesome. It really is a runner show. No, no, the visual is beautiful. You know, but it's difficult for me to go in and say I'm the greatest guy in the world. Right? You need to hire me because I'm the guy. But it's easier to have, you know, and that's why we have agents and managers, and they've also protected themselves, lawyers. I mean, I, I have more hands in my pocket than, you know, it, here's something that I wish they taught us in theater school, which was the business end of, of this business mm -hmm. and how to handle that. That's something that I had to pick up along the way, you know, and I, it's really something worth exploring. I don't know what your program here is like, but, uh, you know, certainly you'd arm your, uh, your students uh, for the real world if you also taught them the business side of, of the uh, business and, and, and how to deal with that. I mean, because you have, you come all prayed, everybody comes across like they're your pal and they have your best interest at heart and they're the one, they're really the one of the few people who actually cares about you, but they all have that one, you know, dollar sign in their eye and uh, they see you as a way to, uh, to make money. You know, you have business managers who take 5% of the gross income Lawyers take 5% of your gross, agents take 10%, mm -hmm. managers take 10 or 15% of your gross, government takes, what, 47%? That doesn't leave you as much. <laughs> you know, I remember when, when I first got JAG and I was, was making a uh, salary and I was driving home at 4 a.m. after working like a 19-hour day, and it had been many 19-hour days in a row, and I was, I was doing the math in my head as I was trying to stay awake driving home. Called him the next morning. I said, "Guess what? You just—you're either going to lose your job or you're going to cut your percentage down by less than half." Is what you're doing. You did. Yeah. yeah you, did. <laughs> you know, it's difficult because uh, actors are sensitive people, artists are sensitive people, and people in this business prey on that. You know, they prey on your sensitivity and and your your feelings of loyalty, and they try to make you feel like you know, God, you know, this is a it's a personal thing. That you're doing, and then you know, and really, it's a business thing, and it's it's hard to separate the two. And so, if you taught those things to them in school, it might be you know you might adjust to them a little sooner than than when it's suddenly because it's a business where you bust your ass for a long period of time, and then boom, one day it happens. You know, you get that job, and you start making more money than you've ever made in your life, and you don't quite know where to go with it. You don't know what to do with it. 
that's when the vultures move in, and that's when a lot of people make mistakes. Are they a necessary evil? The, uh... Some of them are, some of them aren't, you know. And there's a time to get some, and there's a time not to have them. You know, like I realized, you really don't, like a manager, you really don't need a, you need a manager if you're changing agents, or if you're trying to break into another facet of the business, say you made it in the TV end, and you wanted to break into the movie end, and you were looking for someone who had a connection somewhere, you might need a manager, might have some connections, and he could break some walls down that an agent might not. You need a lawyer later on when you're making the bigger deals than you do initially. But uh, I tell you, when I first, like when I first got Jack, the lawyers showed up, the agents, the business managers were all over me, you know, and I really didn't need a lawyer at five percent of the gross at that period of time, mm -hmm. or a business manager for five percent of the gross. And as it turned out, we, you know, I've went through business managers for a while, and now I don't have one for that very. I mean, we, you know, we did the math, and we went, "This is insane." Paying this guy this amount of money, and what is he doing really? In fact, most of those guys were, were screwing up my accounts worse than I could possibly do it uh, because they made false claims. And, and lawyers the same way. You know, you really have to assess the situation and don't make these knee-jerk reactions when people show up on the set telling you, "Listen, you're going to have these problems." You know, it's it's difficult, and that's why guys like you or whoever the teachers are should be. In on, 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 in that whole area, you know? mm -hmm. And is um, John? Uh, do you have an agent right now? Uh, actually, I'm represented by the same agent Dave is represented by, and we're at U UTA. Mm -hmm. a guy by the name of Jason Hayman. And uh, from a writer's perspective, is is an agent a necessary part? You said you represented yourself early on. Uh, how about now, as you start to, you know, as you have a reputation now? Well, I think the smartest thing I've learned uh, on a writing thing, I've. When I first got to town, I learned I met a the vice president of the William Morris Corporation, and I flipped him one of my scripts. And he said basically, things you want to write are the things that are the easiest for me to sell as an agent. So if you're if you're going to go to town, don't go to town with one script. Go to town with like five or six or seven or eight spec scripts from everything from a sitcom to a feature film to a TV drama or whatever really really interests you. That way you have seven or eight different you know, varied ideas that could fit into any different niche depending upon who you meet and when you meet that person. So um, I still consider myself in the wannabe stages of things. I'm busting my butt to try to, to get to the other side, but at the same time, I'm involved in the process now of being with JAG uh, for the last couple of years. It's been a, a real education just behind the scenes. You read all those books and you read all those magazines and you see all those movies about how Hollywood is this way, and watch out for this one, and watch out for that one. And you don't really believe it's true until you're there, and then you see it. And then uh, I have a lot more respect for David now than I, I mean, just simply because of the, uh, the the things he had to overcome just when he got to town and hearing of his story that made me tougher, and it made me say, okay, I'm not going to quit because you know there were certain points where he could have quit, and he just sucked it up, and he just kept going. So perseverance and persistence is very, very big if you, if you want to make it. I thought I'd go to town and sell a script in a week. I went in 93, I'd get my money, go home to my family, and live off of that money and have a good time. And I, I ended up living on somebody's patio and uh, from 93 up till, was it 2005 now? Yeah. <laughs> Things got a little better financially, a lot better financially, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's been a process. You still on the patio? Or? No. <laughs> <laughs> Some improvement. Yeah, Um, just uh, because I know you have some fans here, let's just talk about Jag for a second. Um, on a long-running TV series, your character is bound to evolve. You've always seen that in, in uh, any long-running series. You see a character change from beginning to end, uh, whether they're uh, you know, lesser characters or you know, principals or uh, leads. Uh, how do you feel your character evolved, or did you? from the beginning to the end? Well, you did for me. Um, and that certainly kept it interesting for me for 10 years, you know, for the long run. And I think, you know, that, it, that the show, shows would last that long if characters didn't evolve. Mm -hmm. Good Creed relationships evolved, certainly. Uh, and you just, you know, every year, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, the writers would, would call and, and they'd say, what are you thinking about next year? 
drinking or doing any uh, ideas you have about. Would they defer uh, to you a lot? They will occasionally, you know. Well, they would. Every at the beginning of every year, they, there would be discussion. Uh, it, it seems like the series takes on a life of its own at a certain point too. You you go into every season with a plan, and plans change. I mean, we had a big plan one season, and uh, when Co Star got pregnant, and everything changed. You know, so things like that can happen. You need a plan before you can, you know, change direction anyway. Otherwise, you just at sea or adrift. And, uh, I guess you, you found out more about the character. That was one of the things I said, let's explore, you know, this or that. Let's find out who his friends are. Let's find out, uh, you know, how he feels about certain issues. And, uh, you know, it's, it's ideas. And then you're pretty much as an actor on the front lines, so you, you're just surviving script to script. You'll change stories often midweek. You'll finish one episode on a Tuesday, and you start the next episode on a Wednesday. So there's never a period of time where you can go, ah, okay, I did that one, now let's think about this next one. You're thinking about the next one in the middle of the one you're working on, you know, and uh, so it's, uh, it's almost a bit of a struggle to get through, and you know, put your best foot forward and everybody, you know, you try and keep everyone's spirits up. Uh, you know, that was something that uh, my producer told me early on. He said, he said listen, you are the, you're the main guy that everyone's looking to. You've got to keep everyone fucked up. You've got to keep them focused. You've got to make sure that the, the set remains focused and you get through the day, you know. Um, so, well, no pressure. Your question. No, no pressure. You know, there's an enormous amount of pressure in that position and then some people rise to the challenge. Other people fall apart. Um, I always looked at it as a business and uh, uh, you know I enjoyed the process and I, and I enjoy the craft but if you approach it in a business sense then you're more likely to, to not be taken hostage by it. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, you have to become a bit of a Zen master to really pull that off. I have a wife and two children uh, and I have you know, I, I need to pay attention to them as well as to that. And you have publicity on top of doing the show and doing your work there. You still have to maintain a level of uh, cue in the public eye. Um, you know, and, uh, and you want to have a life as well, right? So I managed to do that for 10 years. You know, I found the formula for me. I, I, I remember talking to Tom Selleck and, and uh, Scott Bakula, two guys uh, who I respected. And, and I knew uh, certainly Tom had Find something you can hang your head on and always put the first best foot forward. You know? It took me a while to figure out what he meant. I find something you can hang your head on. And, you know, but uh, I, I, I think I did and, uh, and I managed to do that. You know, I've got a family. I, I found ways to, to stay sane on a set. You know, uh, there's a lot of downtime on a set. The lighting and you can fall prey to the insanity. You know, there's a lot of gossip on a set. You can hang around and talk madness with people, or you can retire to your trailer and, and find some sanity there, you know, uh, I played guitar and, and wrote music and found musicians, uh, you know, in the crew, and we'd get together and jam, and uh, or Johnny and I would work on scripts with him, and, uh, and found some way to remove yourself so that when they brought you in, you were fresh and alive, and your, your excuse me, your energy was up. And Seems like after 10 years, it would, it would run the risk of becoming routine. Yeah, and that's something I fought against. And, and, and you know what, I, you know, to the credit of everyone on the show, I think, you know, I always tried to, certainly some personnel changed over the years, but, but there were some who were there from the beginning and, and everybody really felt, you know, that they had, that they gave 200%. And, uh, and that was important. And that was something that I always tried to propagate when I was there. Keep it fun and alive and keep putting it up you know, take it seriously. And uh, a lot of people start phoning it in after a certain period of time. And I couldn't do that. I couldn't live. I couldn't I couldn't show up every day in North Philly. It would just be so, such a drag. Right. You know, but I felt after 10 years, I, I decided that that was it for me. You know, I did run its course. And, uh, and so I uh, made a decision to leave. And uh, I just no longer the need to, to develop a new show. Can you talk about it or no? 
Well, it's still in the fledgling stages. You know, John and I, as I said, have, have, uh, have two uh, series ideas, and we're going to be pitching soon. Uh, I, I told, you know, when I went in for the first meetings uh, to talk about, you know, possibly going over there uh, with the head of the network and the, and the heads of the departments. Uh, I told them briefly about my ideas, and they were they seemed excited by them. You know, it's a, it's a great network, uh, ABC. They're really up and coming now. They got some fresh ideas, and uh, so I'm excited. You know, and if it's not one of our ideas, it will be an idea that comes to me, and then I believe John will be there, and uh, and we'll develop it and make it a better idea. So, whatever it is, we'll be involved in the creative process to some yeah. degree. Yeah. And uh, so you consider you guys. You guys both consider yourselves a team where you're going through. You know what? In this business, uh, and I don't, you know, I don't want to monopolize the mic, but um, if you could, just a lot of it's a lot of strange characters out there. And if you find some people that you can work with, that you trust, that you work well with, then you know, if you can be with those people, all the better for your sanity. And so, you know, I found a guy who I respect and care about and and like working with and work well with. And so, I'd like him to be uh, in my life professionally. He's not monopolizing the mic. He's had uh, 20 times more experience than I have. I learn from him every day, and I learn from the process every day. And uh, uh, this, this is not a thing. I, I'll get upset sometimes, and I'd get mad at some things that the studio would do or things that, and he always kept my head level. I'm from Boston College. I played football there in the food years, and uh, I'm kind of a hot head at certain times, and he took that out of me, which is good. You can't you, you, you've got to be almost like a poker player in Hollywood, and you got to keep your emotions in check. And uh, the biggest lessons that I've learned from David are to keep my emotions in check and to always be creative, always be persistent, and most importantly, never, ever quit. And I own for that. You guys have talked about pitching this new idea. Um, I try to put into one of my classes the importance of the pitch and have them pitch a short script idea. Talk a little bit to them because it doesn't seem to resonate with them, and, and they get up there and they mumble through some uh, kind of. Well, you're 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 selling an right. idea first right. off, so you know you better be alive. You are the focal point. I, uh, here's a perfect example. We had a uh, my wife and I produce. We have a production company, and uh, and we went to uh, Merv Griffin. You know, to drop a name is a uh, is a friend of ours, and uh, Merv has a production company. So we went to Merv, and we were. Uh, pitching idea for a film that, that we love the idea and uh, we I've been a, a friend of ours had the idea initially and then we helped him change it somewhat because it had been he pitched it uh, to a few people around town anyway Merv had never heard of it so we pitched it at another place and it, and it was a beautiful pitch and they loved the idea but nothing happened with it so excuse me we went to Merv we went in the room and Josh our other partner is doing the pitch, okay, he's selling this idea. Well, the pitch went on too long. And Merv is long. a very busy man. Well, I guess, you know, you probably have five, 10 minutes to sell your story. <laughs> and we sold the story for about 25 minutes. <laughs> an hour, okay, even worse. <laughs> went on for an hour, and the first thing Merv said was, oh my God, <laughs> that's the longest pitch I've ever had to sit through. Listen, I have got four meetings that I'm, I'm already late for, and I don't have time, you know, and we're out of being a bad deal. So we never sold it to Mervyn. He was a friend. So keep the pitch <laughs> short and to the point and interesting. You should practice the pitch uh, in front of your friends and uh, and get it down. Don't go in and try and wing it thinking, oh, yeah, I got an idea. And, uh, so like one of our, you know, we wrote the, the first script pilot that we, that we actually wrote the script because I went, I know what I want the series to be, but there's certain facets of it that I want to be unknown for a period of time and to develop at, in the first year of the show. Okay, there's certain ideas, there's certain things that I want to remain mysterious for a while. And I wasn't sure how to pitch that, so I said, John, let's screw it. We won't write a pitch. Generally, what you do is you write a piece of maybe a, a page or two as a brief synopsis or outline, and you'll hand that around, and then you'll pitch it so that they can later basically see what your pitch was on paper and try to, you know, re-remember it if they're interested. Okay, so I wasn't quite sure how to do that without cheating the piece in my mind, so I said, let's just write the whole thing. You know, normally what you want to do is you go in with your idea and hopefully they'll pay you to write it. 
Okay, but I said, let's just do it for free, screw it, and we'll make the whole thing. So that's what we did, uh, and we haven't pitched that yet, uh, but I was even told now that uh, we gotta come up now with a pitch somehow to go in and before we hand the script over, for fear that it fall in the hands of a reader, you know? Uh, and then all our efforts will have been for not. But that, you know, I guess to you know, to answer your question, keep it brief, keep it interesting, and keep it fetching. You know, uh, and practice in front of your friends and really get it down. It's it's like doing a it's like doing a it's it's like doing a a, a party piece. You know, it's like doing a, a it's an audition. So you're on. Be interesting. Yeah, be interesting. Yeah, be interesting is a big thing. If it doesn't hold your interest, if the pitch doesn't hold your interest, if storyline doesn't hold your interest. When I ever went into a pitch meeting, I just, in my head, I always thought, what's this? And well, the other thing I used to do, too, I did a lot of homework. I get biography magazines, so anybody I ever met with, I know about them. I know where they were from. I know what school they went to. I try to find some common thread of interest. So when I was going to go pitch this person, I know what his interests were and his likes were. And if I didn't do my homework on the person I was going to pitch, then it was my fault for not knowing what this guy liked or what he disliked. Seriously, there was. Uh, I sat once in a in a pitch meeting uh, with uh, Don Belisario uh, in the beginning. I think it was the second season of Jag. I happened to walk in the office, and writers were coming in pitching ideas. You know, because uh, I think the the writers feel the rule is they have to buy three spec scripts from from outside writers for every season on every uh, show. So writers come in, and they generally they come in with three ideas, and they'll sit in the room and sit in front of the head. You know the creator and then the, and the writers and throw their ideas out there. Um, and it was an interesting process, you know. And, and it was interesting. And they they all had some great ideas, and it was all about presentation, really, that, that sold anything. And uh, just a quick little uh, side story. They just so you know what you're liable to run into when I was auditioning for the show. Don had a co-executive producer, uh, Howard Kazanjian, who'd done. Uh, Andy the Lost Ark. Anyway, he was a big producer in Hollywood, and he was doing the series of Dawn. So, and there were some other producers around at the time. And I go in for the third audition, and and I read, and Don goes, "Okay, sit down." And he tells this nasty joke, and he makes the butt of the joke the co-executive producer, and then he's watching me, and this guy's watching me. You know. Do I laugh at his joke? And then at the, to the detriment of this guy? I mean, it was a real difficult kind of political moment that I was thrust into. And it uh, was, it was obviously handled it well because I got the, uh, the job. But uh, you never know what's coming your way. You know? How did you handle it? Did you I kind of laughed and then looked over at him like, hey, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was It was a difficult moment, but I, I managed to, uh, to tread that fine line of you know, not insulting either one. Do you guys find that there are moments like that where it's make or break, where something just happens at the drop of a hat and you have to, it's survival of the fittest at that point? To me, survival of the fittest is always just being able to pay my rent. <laughs> uh, but in, in terms of, if, if I go into a room and I know the people I'm dealing with, like when I first went to pitch with Jack, David told me about the person I was gonna talk with, he's this, he's this, he's this, he likes this, he likes that, so I, at least knew he liked hockey when I went in there, so I spoke to him two minutes about hockey before I went in there. So uh, there are certain times to laugh, there are certain times not to laugh, there are times to keep your mouth quiet and let the experts around you voice their opinions. And when we went in for the, uh, I guess when the, the big trial thing is when we wrote our uh, pilot for uh, ABC, the big thing was going in to meet the UPA agents and getting their uh, approval on it and what they thought about it. And that to me, in terms of my life, that was a big, big, uh, make or break moment for me. I mean, whether these guys, these the head literary agents, the UTA, they're gonna like something that we put together and so I, I think that's what you yeah, have to be careful about. They, uh, we read it and you know, I called them and said, listen, I put this script in and they were like, oh, I said, I want you to read it. And they're like, oh, okay. And you could hear, you knew they were going, oh great. They've written the script and now I have to read it. <laughs> and, th but they, but they really thought, I mean, they were going away. The first thing, the first me I got a message from, from two of them who were like going, wow, it was awesome. They were, they really liked the script, so they were pleasantly surprised. Um, I was thinking of a story, you know, to touch on that, that I, I auditioned for uh, years ago, uh, what wound up being the most successful Canadian play ever. It was, uh, it, 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 we, 
Jim ran for two years. We went to the Edinburgh Theater Festival with it. We uh, eventually was going to go to Broadway. I left the show at that point, but uh, I went in to audition for it. And uh, after the audition, the director sat me down and he goes, "All right, so what do you want to be?" Well, I don't know what happened at that point. God stuck His hand up in my mouth, and, and I went, "Why do you want to be a director?" You know, <laughs> who gives a shit? This is basically this is the bottom line. If you don't hire me for this role, you're crazy because I'm the only guy who can play it. And that's it. And I got up and I walked out and I thought, I don't have a job. <laughs> I didn't have a job and I didn't have any money and, and I, was, I was looking at hard times and, uh, and I walked home and I thought I'd just blow not only the job but probably my career because Toronto is a pretty small town. And I wasn't home. Ten minutes the phone rang and I got the job. So you never know what's going to work. But that's a pitch in and of itself, right? When you yeah. pitch yourself as well as your wife. I guess, you know, and I don't even know. It was like I was sitting outside of myself, <laughs> listening to it as it went down, going, oh my God, I can't believe you said that. Um, last two questions for me. First off, for our uh, actors in the uh, audience, um, and also for our budding directors. Uh, it, one of the hardest classes for me to teach is about directing actors, because each actor is different, each person has a different style. How do you like to be directed? What's what's your advice for the directors and the actors? Well, first of all, uh, you know, generally how I've uh, how we did it in the theater is you would explore it initially, and then you would come together in a piece. Nobody likes to be told stand here, walk over there, do that, and then you move over here. Occasionally, if it's a it's a particularly stylized piece, you know, you may have to succumb to that kind of direction, but but uh, generally you want to explore the piece, find, you know, where it motivates you to go, and then you kind of come together and you work together on a piece. Uh, I've had, I mean, I, I've worked with so many directors over the years, and I, I remember uh, like right out of theater school, first season in Stratford, the director came in, and he was a new director, and he'd been at home with the set, with a model of the set, and he had little actors toothpick actors <laughs> on little stands and went, you do this, da, 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 you go here, you go over there, and, and the entire cast just kind of looked at him like, oh yeah, that's going to be happening. <laughs> uh, you know what I found? I mean, if directors take acting classes, it will help them to learn how to talk to actors, how to, and uh, if you understand, intel you know, it's, there's a lot of a lot of people I find who come from the technical end of things, who are like camera people first, or they come from that background, are less in touch with how a story unfolds and and how to talk to actors than directors who come from uh, say a theater background. Um, and uh, and here's another piece of advice for actors: when I get, first came out of theater school, a lot of, when I went to Hollywood, uh, a lot of guys were you know taking study classes, and I thought, well, I've just done that for four years. I don't need to do that. Okay, I know what I'm doing now. Well, that's that's really not so much about acting; it's about keeping your chops, you know. And that's a good idea. It's a good thing to do. In fact, you know, I'll probably get back into a scene study class again, just to just to, you know, keep working. Uh, and a lot of directors go and watch those scene study classes and watch, you know, how the how the teachers work with the actors, and, and that's a great idea, you know. If you want to be a director, sit in some acting classes. And uh, finally, both of you, uh, after uh, being in different places, ended up in Los Angeles. Is that for, since the, the theme of tonight is surviving the entertainment industry, is going into the lion's den, is that the necessary part of the process? As a writer, as an actor, if you're going to <coughs> Succeed if you're going to survive uh, the entertainment industry. Do you have to end up out there? Uh, I, you, I, w I always thought I could mail it in. I thought I could, if I had the greatest idea in the world and nobody's done it before, they'd have to listen. I'd send it out, and you know, I could send every script in from Boston, hang out with my family who I dearly love. I'm, I'm really, my, I'm family oriented. I love spending time with my family. I live in Salem, Massachusetts, and my whole focal point in life has been my family and my friends and. Uh, I've never been very big on material things. Hollywood, it, it's the most, I'm not calling it materialistic, but it's, there's a lot of money around there, there's a lot of uh, ego around there, and there's a lot of um, uh, 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 wickedness, and 
It's, it's not the nicest place in the world to uh, hang your hat. It's a, it's, a, it's a necessary means to make money. Everything's filming out there. But at the same time, uh, you, 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 can't, you can't be in Boston and go to an audition. You can't be in Boston and go to uh, get an agent. You can't be in Boston and go do a pitch every day. You can't be in Boston and know what's going on in the trades here. It's, it, you have to be on, in the area. And, uh, and I learned that uh, by going out there. I thought I was going to stay a week in 93, and I've been out there ever since. Okay, my opinion is that you, you can gain some experience before you go if you're trying to be a big fish in a big pond somewhere else first, like staying in Boston. I guess I'd have to say uh, um, uh, the opposite of what John said. You know, I was able to, when I went out there, I'd already been on a television series for five years. I'd already worked in business in front of the camera. I had a wealth of experience. I had tape. I, you know, I'd worked in the theater and I went out there and I wasn't trying to, you know, crack this insanely huge nut uh, with no experience. So, and when I, when we lived and worked in Chicago, you know, they had a, a wonderful uh, theater community there and they also, a lot of Hollywood production came there and they also had some of their own production. <laughs> And uh, Toronto was the same way. I don't know what Boston's like because uh, you know I've only been here a couple of times, but I would imagine they have a theater community, and I would imagine that they shoot some things here, and I would imagine they have talent agencies, and it would be better. You'd be better off starting here, gaining some experience here, before going out there, because there are hundreds of thousands. Everybody goes out there with the impression that they're going to be discovered. Guy does a commercial in his hometown, some local television station. Boom, he figures that's that's you know I've just found my profession. I'm going out to Hollywood. I'm going to New York. You know, and it's not that easy. You know, it's easier to don't go out there until you're ready. Don't go out there until you have an agent because you're going to go out there. You're going to be knocking on doors with everyone else, and you're going to be ignored, <coughs> and you're going to get frustrated, and you're going to lose your your dream, and you're going to come home. And don't forget why, you know, I forgot initially when I went out there, I did well initially, and then I went through a period of time where I lost my muse, I guess, you know, and I forgot why I got into the business. I kept going into meetings trying to figure out what you wanted from me. What is it that they want, you know? And it wasn't until, you know, my wife and I, we went away for a couple months. Uh, I mean, under the worst pressure, you know, she was pregnant, we were deep in debt, and it looked as though we had no hope. And we went away, went to the Bahamas for two months. And I remembered why I got into it in the first place. I, got, I became an actor, not because I wanted to be rich and famous, but because I loved acting and I loved what it was about. And I loved the, the history of it. I loved the process. I loved the, you know. And when I remembered that, I came back and I went into the rooms and I didn't care what you wanted. This is what I had to offer. This was my interpretation of material that I had, and I haven't stopped working since. So, you know, it's really important that you remember that, and that you go there and you own who you are, you know, and you, when you walk in a room, you own that space, and you feel that you have a right to be there. And a good way to do that is to gain some experience and some confidence in a smaller arena first. That would be my advice. And if I may say something to, uh, I wish I wish they would have had the program that you have here now, back when I was going uh, to DC, because I, mean, I, I was basically self, the first script I wrote, I, you know, I thought I was doing it right. I'd have the character name on the left, and then I put all the dialogue on the right. And, it, and I, my first script ever, I, you know, it's a page a minute, I didn't even know that. My first script I ever knocked off was 245 pages. You know, I'm thinking this is a movie, so I had no idea whatsoever. And the first thing I did when I went to Hollywood, I found this thing, uh, Raw Data, it said, one out of every 375,000 people who come to this town with their script get their script bought. And in my head, I was just saying, I'm going to be that one. And I just never, never quit. And you have a tremendous advantage here and I, in, in this Boston and film program we have here. And like, again, I wish you would have had this when I was going to school here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, um, I'd like to open it up for the audience now. Just have them ask a few questions before we let you go. And uh, so. Uh, anyone who's interested can come right up to the mic right here, and or you could just scream from your seat. It's, we'll we'll hear you. So right over there.
you know, and this is uh, this is how I did it uh, because I started in Toronto. It was easier to get an agent, and uh, and I uh, I had a job. I started in the theater, and so I didn't need an agent to get me a job in the theater. I don't imagine it would be the same here. Uh, the equity uh, you put that on a magazine, let you know where the auditions are. In fact, uh, I became a member of the Stratford Shakespeare Festival Company, which is the largest classical repertory theater in North America. And uh, I crashed that audition. I heard where it was, and I went and sat in the room, and when somebody didn't show up, uh, I, I offered to go in an audition, I got the job. So I got an agent that way, and then when I had a job, uh, we came to Hollywood in a, in a much gentler way. You're never going to get an agent. I don't know of anybody who has ever got an agent sending their picture and resume into these agencies. I've been at the agencies when I've seen a stack of people who sent in their picture and their resume, and I've seen the uh, person on the front desk shredding them. It, you just never do it. You got to know somebody. You got to get in somehow. You got to use your imagination. You got to hang out in the beginning. You got to schmooze. You got to find somebody who can get you in that room so that you can sell yourself. To those people. You got to have a friend who's got an agent. So that's that's would be my advice to you. Get a job. Then the agent can come and see you in the play. You know. Stand up straight for a while, but the G force is really you know, compressed the spine, right? Yeah, so my hat's off to you. Flew 14? You flew four as well. Okay. So pretty fast, too. Huh? Someone would take the shot, and then I'd go watch it if I felt, you know, generally, I mean, at this point, after 10 years, I know when I'm on and when I'm off, and uh, it, was it was difficult to split my focus. What I found is, when I was acting, was it was harder to not be watching what the other players were doing, and to just try and be in the moment. Uh, that was a difficulty, but I, you know, I think I managed to, to pull that off. But if there was ever any question, I could go look at the playback, and, uh, and decide if we can need another take or not. Was more concerned. I was also being concerned about the camera because I couldn't watch exactly what the camera was doing, and you would have to trust the cameraman or your or my DP. You know. Anything else? Right over here. I guess, you know what, I think I know what you're asking, and, and again, I go back to having started in a smaller arena before I went out there, so that I got to make my mistakes on a, on a smaller scale, uh, and learn without, you know, without being the, 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 be the end, you know, without your first mistake being your last mistake, uh, there was still a second chance, you know, and that's another reason to start small before you go. You know, luckily, and, and I guess thankfully, uh, my success came later. I had success.
success, certainly always made a living acting, but my greatest success came after a long period of um, great understanding of the business, you know. Yeah, I was considering that uh, just before I got JAG, in fact. Oh no, just before I got uh, the Art Festival. And, uh, you know, I, it'd be wonderful to be able to do that. But, uh, you know, I just, I don't know, I don't, who knows? I got a good, one of my best pals at that show right now. I've been there for six years, and uh, I was just talking to him, and he wants to come to Hollywood because he's, you know, he's over it now. But uh, it would certainly be fun to do some theater again. No, they, uh, their, their uh, option wasn't picked up, uh, which is odd. We were on NBC for the, you know, this is one of the unique things about the show is we were on NBC, we were on another network for a year before we went to CBS and we went on for, uh, you know, for another nine years and beat NBC and everything they put against the show that they threw away. But uh, the, on the pilot, I was with uh, Andy Parker, who uh, they said, they didn't want in the show, so they then offered her her own show on the same network uh, immediately after dropping her from JAG. And then, uh, um, and then Meg, I guess, was the other character of the first season, and CBS didn't want her. So. No, it's really, I mean, it's up in the air. They, you know, they may, we may present our ideas and they may go, you know what, these suck, and they're not any good. And they probably won't say they suck, but, you know, they could say, yeah, it's really wonderful work, guys, but uh, we're thinking, uh, you know, no. Um, and, uh, what was the other question? Um, it's, it's good to socialize and show shows. Oh, yeah, I really like that. You know, it was, uh, yeah, it, it, you gotta want, I had to, you know, if I wanted to help, I had to watch how I approached helping. Uh, which it could be painful later on. Um, and then if I didn't do anything, that could be painful later on. Uh, so it was uh, tricky. Um, but it was interesting. You know, and when she did really well, which is, you know, in the end, she. She always did really well. <laughs> <laughs> you had to ask the question, didn't you? Uh, it, you know what? It could be wonderful, usually. It was always wonderful. Sometimes it was more wonderful than others. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Let her move. I was going to say, uh, what was one of your biggest challenges uh, coming to the show with Jack? Uh, and then what was that work? First season, and, and you know, coming, you know, realizing what it was going to take to make this work, and the scope of what the job entailed. You know, you get into it, and uh, and then suddenly there, especially in the first season when it had a lot of uh, media interest, and uh, and there was cameras in your face, and then you had to learn how to deal with media. So you weren't just. It wasn't enough just to act in the piece. You had to keep continually selling. And I had to learn the, the art of the sound bite and uh, you know how to stay interesting for three seconds and to and keep your answer sh succinct and, and interesting. And, and it was difficult. It was hard for me, you know, because uh, it was new and uh, I'd never done it and I and uh, it wasn't something that I really like all about publicity, you know. Uh, that's another way I guess I, I found a way for me to survive. 
live, which was it was more about the work always with me. I know some people it was more all about the publicity. They were really more interested in seeing your picture or their name in print, and that was something that I just felt was part and parcel of the job. And uh, and I realized that I, you know, it was something that I paid to have happen, and, uh, and it wasn't an arbitrary position on someone else. You know, it was something that I propagated so my people did. You know, so again, it's that and. You know, every day you had to be on. I mean, it was a difficult transition to go from not working steadily to suddenly being the main person and the responsibility that came with that. You know, it, was, it was a tough job, but uh, it was something that, that, you know, I tell you, I, I just ran the Boston Marathon yesterday, and I, I run a bunch of marathons, and I've done a lot of, you know, that, those type of endurance uh, sports. And I always made those about how to succeed in life. You know, if I could complete that, then I could see my way through to this. And I always tried to see everything through to the end and to never give up. And so that's a little, you know, Zen tone that I can borrow here and there that, you know, that I live with to finish the job, you know. So it was, uh, it was a giant mountain that I had to climb. And, uh, so to answer your question of the first season of the show, yeah, I was... Difficult, and I find it's difficult to watch the show. Uh, I, I watch it on USA. I, I rarely watched an episode after it was shot because it was too close. I was too close to it at that point. I needed some distance to forget about what it took to get every take and, and where my favorite takes were. When I, when I, if I were to watch an episode immediately after finishing shooting it, I remember every minute of every day. And then I'm not liking the way I looked. I didn't like the way they were lit. And You know, that's a question that, that I was asked often, and I'm not sure I can answer it. You know, it, it had a loyal fan base in the beginning, and uh, I, that which burns brightest burns quickest. We did, the media never took off, but it was never a media business. It uh, grew by word of mouth, um, and the loyal fan base grew, and they always hung in, and people who liked the show loved it. They were like all about it. And initially, I mean, the show started before we were in this time of war, uh, and it was during the Clinton years, and they were downsizing. Nobody was really interested in the military. Uh, you know, it'd been years since the military had been in this setting, like it is again. You know, but uh, and so it was interesting that the show took off at all. But uh, you know, I guess it, it was it was a sh also on another level. It was a show that had a lot of I just call it the whole ball of wax show. It had Stories and you know, a little bit of everything. So I got yeah, my relationships. I, well, I can have my own theory on why Jag stood out amongst everything else. Most things you see on TV are cops, people killing each other, CSI crime scene investigations, people getting sick in hospitals. Um, there's very, very. I mean, I think it's the only show that actually represents America, and it's. I, I like to call it like a John Wayne type of show where there are, there's heroism. There's, uh, there is virtue and there is all the good things that this country is represented in that show. And there are a lot of people in this country who um, identify with that. And I always thought it was like, it's, it's not about the precious, it's about, it's about people going out and standing up for their country. And um, I don't mean to get all patriotic here or anything like that, but I just, feel, I just think it's, a, it's, like, it's like, I don't want to say 40s or 50s either, it's like the John Wayne days when you, 
people wanted a hero, and there aren't too many heroes left on together than cops and robbers and uh, doctors and anybody you guys could think of. Thanks. We have time for one more question, so we'll go up there. Uh, Well, the, uh, there was, a, there was uh, uh, the writers spoke with, uh, with JAG personnel for every script they wrote. Uh, we would run, every script went to the Navy. They would hand in notes on it. We, on the set every day, we had a technical advisor who was a 22-year veteran of the Marine Corps. Uh, and, uh, and there were a lot of you know, ex-military people working on the sets. But basically, we ran everything through uh, through the Navy and, and through Jag Lords, and whoever whoever was uh, represented in the story, uh, the, the real people uh, in those positions had a voice, and uh, could and then were allowed to voice their concerns and give notes. However, you know, our first our job is to entertain, so you know, occasionally you have to tell the military, look, guys, you know, it may not be technically absolutely correct. However, it would be a dreadful bore if this were a training film. So, <laughs> and, and, you know, we were trying to make some money here too. So, you know, we, we did our best. And one of the things that people loved about the show is technically it was about as accurate as you could get in Hollywood. And uh, so, and we, you know, we made great efforts to, to be that whenever we could. Did you guys ask any of those people if they thought you were in the military at all? Oh, absolutely. I have an enormous respect for the military and, and what they do sacrifice they make and thank God you know for us in this country that, that we have such a uh, you know a powerful military and, uh, and, and guys who take that position really seriously you know and it's uh, really uh, wonderful to have uh, to have that because we wouldn't be sitting here all day today so. and uh, just like to wrap up with a couple of things um, first of all uh, John Jetson Pache uh, 227 episodes, and in doing some research on uh, tonight, uh, I saw that co-executive producer uh, Charles Johnson referred to want, uh, Jagathon as one of his top three favorites of all time. So I think that's something that is pretty amazing to have your first, was that your first uh, yeah. first one? Uh, to, to make such an impact on uh, one of the people, and uh, David James Elliott, Thank you for 10 years and 227 episodes. That's uh, a pretty amazing feat uh, in uh, modern television, so for a television drama. So thank you very much. For <laughs>